and thanks, Marco. It's nice to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk today about a couple things. I'm mostly going to talk about this book that I had published uh, at the beginning of summer uh, from MIT called Art and DIY Electronics. Um, this kind of came, actually came out of my research that I was, and work that I was doing as a grad student at UC Irvine. Um, I had started kind of exploring the idea of do-it-yourself technology and practices and how artists use technology and it sort of it resulted in this book. So um, I'm also going to show some projects that I've done. So I'm going to start by showing just some background into me, where I come from and stuff like that. And then the second half of the presentation, I'm going to go over a few terms that I think are particular to DIY kind of practices and are especially interesting to people either researching that area uh, or, uh, or artists working with technology or interested in things like um, DIY culture in general, whether it's making zines, punk music, or uh, whatever. So, okay. And if you have a, you have a question, uh, feel free to stop me. All right. Okay, so... My book is actually available uh, for free from MIT Press right now. If you want to download it, you can download the whole thing for free. And it's sort of kind of for a limited time that you can go to MIT Press and download the book um, from open access. So the book is uh, uh, Sorry, my bad. Uh, can you still hear me on Zoom? Yeah? Okay. So, um, so what I do in this book is I, I have been looking at a lot of the history of how technology and art intersected over the past hundred years. Um, looking at how technology got incorporated into the field of art and kind of what different dynamics are in how people use technology in different ways. And in particular, I'm interested in artists that use technology in non-standard creative ways. Um, and this is the abstract from the book. I'm not going to go through all of this, but I generally look at 100 years of what it can kind of be thought of my book as kind of a hundred years before the maker movement kind of got turned into a thing, like maybe 15 or 20 years ago. This idea of makers and, and hackers and kind of creative technologists kind of emerged. I was very interested in kind of what led up to that and what dynamics are involved with that. So the Things that I'm going to basically talk about are wabi-sabi, and these are themes that are in my book. I cover like over a dozen different themes, and I just thought that I'd go over three of them. Wabi-sabi, the idea of um, imperfection being beautiful, or the idea of the, the, the kind of transient, imperfect thing holding beauty in itself. And I see this as a major thing that kind of defines the DIY mindset. Another idea that I see a lot of in artwork that uses technology is the idea of burlesque. Now burlesque is a lot more than an old timey strip show. You know, burlesque is actually a very interesting and powerful concept that can be used to critique um, used as a form of critique. So I'm going to go in and explain uh, kind of an older idea of burlesque that I think is useful for artists working with technology. Another, another thing that I uncover in my book and write about is the idea of zombie technology. And this is the idea of obsolete technologies that kind of die, but then they come back. 
kind of like vinyl or maybe how circuit bending people use toys after they're discarded. So we're going to look at those three things. But first, I'm going to just give a bit of background into myself. Um, so I work as a professor at Emily Carr University of Art and Design. It's one of the top art schools in Canada, and it ranks in the top 15 in the world or something like this. Um, I had started there about 10 years ago as a Canada Research Chair, um, working on researching how art and technology work together in culture um, and all sorts of projects and stuff like that. Um, I should say that also, um, if you've run across my work in kind of the wild, and I'll show some videos that go over this, Three things that I'm sort of well known for are I'm credited with creating the what I really do meme, which you'll see that in a bit. It's a, a panel image thing that was popular, recreated millions of times. I made an arcade cabinet that drives down the street, like a coin operated car racing game that drives down the street. And I made a cockroach controlled robot. Um, Actually, I'll show, I'll show these right now. What my friends think I do. What my parents think I do. Twitter's down. I wish I could tweet about how much this sucks. <laughs> What I think I do is a meme that shows several preconceptions or false assumptions about a job or expertise. Each poster consists of five to six images, illustrating how one is perceived by friends, coworkers, and society in comparison to one's own self-image and the often mundane reality of what their job is really like. The first instance of this meme was posted to Facebook by California artist Garnet Hertz in early February 2012. Yay, thank you, show, thank you very much. Perceived his job as artist and ended with what his job actually entailed. Writing grants. He received over 400 shares. Soon after, others began to replicate the template, creating their own takes on what people think I do. By mid February, what people think I do spawned over a thousand derivative images. The joke ranged beyond the realm of jobs, including such hobbies and subcultures as surfers, gamer girls, and cosplayers. And yes, even internet scientists. Okay. Another project was this. Hi, I'm Garnet Hertz. I'm a research scientist in informatics. The project started with thinking, what would it be like if this driving arcade game could actually drive. It was a custom piece of software, actually a number of pieces of software that run here, um, that look in front of the car, uh, try to interpret what features there are in front of the car. In this case, it looks specifically for roads, and then it draws that road shape in the style of the original video game. So this uh, software that's running looks like the old video game, but it's actually an augmented reality type of system that tries to make the real world look like a video game from the 1980s. I'm Walt Scotty. I'm the research director for the Center for Computer Games and Virtual Worlds here at the University of California. I should say that, just to interject for a second, people like that are very important to get jobs done. <laughs> At this point, uh, it's more of an explore, exploration, it's an experiment, uh, but one of the things that's starting to arise from it is whole new ways of thinking about uh, how game-based virtual worlds 
can be embodied into physical uh, devices in order to create new experiences. Uh, and one of the things that uh, is, may come from the Outrun project are new ways of associating, say, game-based uh, therapies for people who might be limited to electric chair-assisted mobility. Uh, so, like kids who are uh, uh, have limited uh, limited ability, quadriplegic or what have you. Uh, may be able to take advantage of some of this technology if we can get it embodied in rather than the form of an arcade machine, also in the form of a power wheelchair. So that's something, an exciting follow-on that uh, we see to this project. It is a bit of an unconventional project and I think it's uh, a testament to the, to the atmosphere and creativity of UCI and computer science that, that something like this can be done and something that can be done that, that really has never been done like this before. So for me, it's, exci it's an exciting place to be and to work uh, that I can do work like this. So I did that as a postdoc, actually. Um, this is a project that I did actually as a master's student at, at UC Irvine. Cockroach-controlled mobile robot is an experimental robotic system that uses a live insect as the controller or driver of a three-wheeled robot. is controlled by a giant Madagascan hissing cockroach, about five centimeters or two inches in length. The insect is placed on top of a modified computer trackball with an adjustable harness that helps the insect stay on top of the ball. The ball operates like a two-axis treadmill that controls the motion of the larger robot. As the cockroach moves forward on the ball, the robot moves forward. If the cockroach scurries to the left, the robot moves to the left. If the cockroach scurries to the right, the robot moves to the right. The robot also features a navigation and sensor system to help the insect avoid smashing the robot into nearby objects. An array of distance sensors looks out in front of the robot. When an object is a few feet in front of the robot, the sensors detect the object and shine lights toward the insect from the direction of the obstacle. Banks of small lights are positioned around the front of the cockroach in an attempt to build an immersive virtual environment. Since cockroaches tend to avoid light, the insect should, in theory, turn it to the dark and therefore steer the robot away from the obstacles. This project is inspired by three key influences. First, biomimetics, an approach to technological development that looks toward living organic systems as a source of inspiration. Specifically within the field of robotics, Cockroaches are admired and used as models for the navigation logic and physical construction of mobile robotic systems. Second, the cyborg. Popular culture appears to have a recurring interest in the human-machine and animal-machine hybrid. This project strives to construct a literal cybernetic organism that plays in and off of cultural and scientific visions of synthetic and organic hybridity. Thirdly, the computational and biological. This project, in essence, is a robotic system in which the computer-based microcontroller is replaced by a biologically-based insect. In the process, the operating machine highlights key characteristics of being biological. The robot and insect display attributes like unpredictability, laziness, irrationality, and emotional response. 
The mobility of the robot makes the intentions of the insect legible to a wide and diverse audience. Individuals tend to watch the robot for extended periods of time, empathizing with the insect and trying to discern whether or not the organism is controlling or being controlled by the technology, and whether it's aware of, immersed in, or placed by its synthetic and mediated environment. Okay, and so those are, those are a couple of projects I've done in the past. Um, other things that I've done, I had organized a, a group called DorkBot in Los Angeles that met in Echo Park uh, starting in about 2003, and I did that for about 13 years. And what was interesting out of this is the publication Make Magazine, who ended up starting Maker Fairs and uh, really led to a research, uh, kind of a birth of hacker spaces and maker spaces. That really formed, uh, my opinion is that it really formed out of DorkBot. I had a friend in San Francisco organizing events in the Bay Area, I was doing LA, and we saw that whole maker thing um, kind of evolve and erupt underneath us with 3D printing, Arduino, all the rest of it, really launched um, to be really popular in, in about 2010 to 2012. Um, I, I had also done an MFA in arts computation engineering. I was in the very first year of a pilot uh, program uh, between computer science engineering and um, art. Uh, I did a PhD in visual studies at UC Irvine, but then I continued working as a postdoc and then as a research scientist uh, in informatics with Paul Durish and other people in informatics. Um, I work, I've worked as faculty at uh, Art Center in the Media Design Program, which is something that sort of is a bit kind of s spiritual sibling to Matt, maybe. Um, and I work right now as Associate Professor and Canada Research Chair um, at Emily Carr University. And if you want to follow along or see any of these projects, you can check out those links. Okay, so now to get into a bit of the book that I wrote. Um, now, I cover lots of different themes in, in the book, and it's difficult to kind of say what is, what is, D, what is DIY mean? Like, it, it stands for do it yourself, but in my mind, it encompasses a lot of other things, and it's sort of like an attitude that I see emerging out of electronic music scenes. I see uh, installation artists, different hackers, people working in hacker spaces or labs. And, I, and so I wanted to try to identify and articulate a few of these themes because I see them in DIY practice in electronics, but I see them very widely in, in um, everything from how people make zines um, or how you can repair your home by going to Home Depot than doing it yourself. There's a, certain, there's a certain element of this that I'd like to propose as kind of like a, a personality or a, mi a DIY mindset. Okay, so. The way that this book, the way that I organize this book is I generally have five different themes. I have um, people doing work with not a lot of resources as one theme, and I write three different chapters on that. Then I have people that are into opening up technologies and exploring the inside of technologies. I have that as a second theme, or three chapters. Then I talk about folks that explore identity and who carve out their identity by doing things themselves because they're not finding it in popular culture. That takes up the third theme. Next, I have a theme of protesters 
for lack of a better term. People that are doing work in opposition to something. That uh, sort of disobedient kind of theme. That makes up the fourth theme. And then I look at the idea of selling out or, or the, the dynamic of artists getting their ideas kind of ripped off by industry and back and forth. Artists ripping off ideas from industry and kind of that, or just the idea of selling out is, is a common thing in DIY culture. So out of these, I'm not going to go into this whole thing. Oh yeah, and also in the book, I, I try to give a history of electronic art in the 20th century. If there's probably one assigned reading that could fit for most of Matt, it would be this beginning chapter, the history of electronic art in the 20th century, it tries to give an overview of kind of, if we try to look at themes over the past 100 years, and it's trippy because it goes back 100 years. It actually started in 1918, 1920, 1923. It's 100 years old. And sometimes you don't think of electronics as being like an antique thing, but it, it really is. Um, so what I'd like to talk about first is this idea of wabi-sabi. And I'd like to use a, uh, a robot by a really famous artist called Namjoon Paik. Has anybody here heard of Namjoon Paik? Couple? People? OK, that's good. He, he's the, probably the most famous person that I write about in my book. Has anybody ever heard of this robot K456? See, Namjoon Paik was much better known for his video work. He's sort of like known as the father of video art. He quoted you know, many times that he's sort of like this figure, established video as a real art form. But he did this crazy audio work and uh, experimental audio work and electronic work before that video work that was really interesting. So I'm going to look at this beauty, this idea of wabi-sabi or the beauty of imperfection. Now, this is actually, this, this robot K456 looks like this, and it's actually on the cover of the, the book. So for me, it's like quite important. And it looked like this pile of junk, kind of. It's kind of like really junky. So he made this robot that went out onto the street, it kind of shuffled around, it barely worked, it had wires hanging all over it, it had like plastic stuff, it had you know, uh, a stuffed toy and a pie plate and motors, it, it, recorded, it had recorded audio that would talk, it, uh, in, uh, it would give audio, but it was sort of like this useless robot that would just kind of shuffle down the street. It shit, it squirted out beans out of its backside, and it was sort of like this robot that was made to be awkward and clunky. So why on earth would, why on earth would an awkward and clunky, th this is video of it running, why on earth would this be an interesting art piece? This is in the 60s, 1964. So, the argument that I made is that Namjoon Pink did this because he, he saw that this was much more an image of being human than a perfect robot. Now, so this, this is like an intentionally junky thing, right? Namjoon Pei actually had super advanced technology, had uh, help, tech, all sorts of technical help that he turned down. So he actually decided to make this thing in what I would say a wabi-sabi kind of approach, where you 
embrace the imperfections of it and you see it as something beautiful and similar to like how has anybody seen the process of if you break um, if you break a cup or you could mend it with metal or gold you see that Kitsugi called or sometimes where something that's broken and be mended can be considered to be more beautiful than the original thing where that hand or or, or the war how things are worn how they give beauty in in their imperfection and in their way that they're not slick and new so i i think that uh, and actually this this is a um in the background is a text by leonard corin he talks about wabi sabi as an opposite of modernism where modernism is you know kind of slick and clean. This, this side is modernism, this side is wabi-sabi. This is modernism, this is wabi-sabi. So it's, uh, it's a way to look at the world in a way that embraces all those bumps and problems and looks at those, looks at those things as a source of beauty. Okay, so wabi-sabi is, um, Modernism is more like a box. Wabi-sabi is more like a handmade bowl. Okay, well, you can think of wabi-sabi as an adjective that describes also handmade objects. Okay, where it's it's not slick, but it's it's more crude than slick. And and what emerges if you if you and you know I only have a, a time to give you a quick introduction to this concept. But the concept is really kind of powerful, and I think sort of transformative just for life, to, be, to have a shift of mindset that it doesn't necessarily have to be slick and perfect to be beautiful, okay? And of course, if I was a motivational speaker, you could spin this into something to empower all of you to embrace the wabi-sabiness of life, you know. But it's true, it is true, and it is really kind of a powerful, um, idea is wabi-sabi. Um, it's appreciation of the worn, the broken, the imperfect. And uh, you see, at the time when Nam Jun Paik was doing stuff like this, there were robots, very, very advanced looking robots out in popular culture. This is a movie from MGM with a, a, a which is sort of like the AI of that era, of the 50s, was this uh, Robbie the Robot, which is like a, you know, this idea of a robot helping humankind was really kind of captured people's imaginations. So this was very, very different. This is not the modern super space age robot. This is the shitty robot made from everyday life. And so my main point with Namjoon Paik's K456 is that I think he was totally doing this on purpose as, as an opposite of this. It was done in opposition to this. It was done to turn this kind of idea of a robot on its head somewhat and say, humans are more like this than like this. This is what human life feels like, kind of. More the attitude of the grittiness of, of existence. Okay, next, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about the idea of the burlesque. And we're gonna talk about it in reference to a project called Hairbrain 2000, made by a Canadian artist named Laura Kakauka. It's a VR project, so all you allosphere people pay attention. Or it's an immersive environment that's so trippy. So this is the Allosphere for $50. <laughs> this is <laughs> the way that this thing works. And this is a tr tricky piece. It has like a kitchen colander, like a strainer on the top of the head. These things are electromagnets that switch, uh, that switch things on and off. Now, there's a, there's a VR, um, uh, goggles in front, but this is actually 
has rolling ball bearings on it that roll around on a surface that makes sparks and that has glass on the inside and if you tilt your head to the front the sparks move forward and then the, the, the selenites on top of your head click toward the top of your head the front of your head if you tilt your head to the right they make sparks so it's kind of like it's almost like a parody of VR made with 1970s kind of technology okay uh, at, the, at the same time, when this happened, VR was very, very popular. VR is also another thing that's been around for um, 40, uh, 60s? It was around in the late 60s and 70s. Um, so this, this is um, taking the, uh, there's a ball bearing that rolls around on this surface. It kind of has this kaleidoscope type thing. This gets fed into this thing and <laughs> you wear it. And you're the only person that can see it. So, and she'd released videos of her waking up and trying to go through her life wearing this <laughs> setup. Which makes it more funny because, like, trying to take the metro, trying to walk down the street, trying to do anything like that is kind of, um, would obviously be a challenge wearing any kind of headset. I'm going to skip forward a bit. So they're not having an easy time. I mean, that's kind of the joke, is that they're kind of wearing a headset in the real world, but not being able to see anything. And where the primary joke is just kind of laughing at them that they're engrossed in this environment. walking around Berlin. Um, so the idea of the burlesque here, I, I, I think the uh, interesting thing, way to think about this Hairbrain 2000 project is as a form of burlesque. Now, burlesque, burlesque, when, when you say the word burlesque, it's everybody thinks of like an old timey kind of striptease thing with like feathers and I don't know something like a like a kind of performance, but it's much more than that. Burlesque. So it's not just an old timey striptease. Burlesque is the idea of kind of like class warfare. The original idea of burlesque is when a lower class thing or person makes fun of an upper class thing. For example, if you take Simpsons and Shakespeare, a, a, a burlesque thing would be kind of like doing a, a cartoon of Shakespeare using using the uh, Simpsons, let's say. On the other hand, upper class people can make fun of lower class people by taking a cultural thing like Shakespeare and maybe using Shakespearean language to describe maybe monster truck driving, a low class thing. Does that make any sense? Burlesque is a form of critique. Okay, burlesque is, is, I think I have some examples here. Okay, yeah, so let's look at Shakespeare, and the bottom says The Simpsons. Um, so if we have, you know, highbrow, high class, rich people, 
Shakespeare, low class Simpsons. Now, if we think, of, and so burlesque can work in two ways. Burlesque can be uh, the low punching up, so to speak, or the high punching down. Burlesque, could, and this is called low burlesque, uh, if it's a low class thing making fun of a high class thing, or high burlesque is the idea of a high class thing punching down into the lower classes. So, for example, low burlesque is Simpsons doing, a, doing Hamlet. Okay? So a low class thing, low brow style, high brow subject matter. Does that make sense? And the opposite, high burlesque is the opposite of that where it's using Shakespearean language to perform the Simpsons. Do you understand the difference? One is, one is high class punching down. I mean, the easier way to think about this is punching up, the low, low class being like, like Laura Kakauka, I would say, is a low brow, low burlesque, where she's using low tech to kind of poke fun at some of the issues with high tech. So I see there's a lot of DIY artists that are in this area that are critiquing high tech that can be thought of as low burlesque, okay? It can be thought of as a, a low burlesque critique of VR. Now, and, and to a certain extent, I mean, to a certain extent, the, the, thing, the stuff that Lord Kakauka had raised in like the early 90s about VR, Many of these issues are still an issue with VR nowadays. Uh, the, the size of headsets, the occlusion of reality, how to do pass-through, uh, you know, all this stuff. Is to, and my spouse works doing UX for Oculus, um, UX research, and it still is totally relevant. I mean, it's, it's outdated and, and, you know, it's its own thing and it's meant to be a funny art project, but... Um, it's still, it's still relevant, I think, are still an issue with VR. Um, other things that, that happen with Harebrain 2000 and other ideas that are kind of related to this idea of the burlesque, you can have high class and low class things at the same time. And this is a very interesting dynamic that I refer to in my book as high lowness. I've also been, heard it called no brow by people, where it's not like a high brow and it's not like a low brow, but it stretches in between those two things. So there's also interesting ability and people intentionally doing high, high class, low class together as one thing. And similarly, high tech and really low tech. Um, where you're intentionally spanning those you can also think about burlesque as, as there's also a tendency in a lot of artworks to span the old and the new, like new technology with old technology. Um, punch tape with uh, digital signal processing or whatever, if you're an audio person, or intentionally spanning old and new together. And I call this neo-retroism. Um, I won't go into what skeuomorphism or palimpsests are, but I, I go into that in my book. Um, um, so it bridges these things. And, and art projects are good for doing this and, and doing it in a metaphorical and often entertaining way. Now. For a last example, I want to show a project by Survival Research Laboratories. Has anybody here ever heard of Survival Research Laboratories? Okay, who, what's Survival Research Labs? In the, in the yellow, or, yellow hair? Me? Yes, you. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know your name. <laughs> uh, 
think it's related to performance art. It's like a counterculture performance art. Yeah, it's performance art. Yeah. Any? Does anybody else want to fill that in? What kind of performance art is it? Robots destroying robots. Yes, robots. Um, and I'm gonna. So I'm gonna talk about this idea of obsolete technology and zombie technology with um, survival research labs. Now, survival research labs has a kind of an important role. Survival research labs, I, th I think at least they had a major role in inspiring events like Burning Man to even happen in the first place. Um, many people that were in the Bay Area involved with tech consider survival research labs to be like the spiritual core of a lot of that Bay Area uh, punk hacker kind of scene. And they started doing robotic, weird thing with creative and weird stuff with robotics starting in the 70s and into the 80s and 90s and through till today. So survival so research labs started in 1979. It started with the idea of uh, of this guy, Mark Pauline, who he had gone to art school, but he was um, not sure what to do with his life. Maybe this is where you're all going to be after you graduate. And he basically sat down and he thought, I could make kind of a robotics performance company thing and host shows with big robots. And at the time that he was thinking about this, in the 70s, this was, it was not really a thing. Like, there's no robot junkyard wars on TV. The, none of this, there's no YouTube of, of Simone Garrett's or people are, um, you know, people making weird robots on YouTube for subscribers. This was like totally like almost out of the blue. So what he did was he had built, started building a number of different machines this is the very first machine called the demanufacturing machine. The way that this thing worked is that it took hey, George, sorry. it took um, uh, devices that were manufactured. It put them down on this belt. It rolled in here, and there's kind of like a lawnmower type of mechanism here that shredded everything. So everything rolls into here. It shreds. It falls down in here, and then it gets flung out toward the audience. So they had put a number of different radios, uh, devices, and different stuff here. Is this basically, and it was called a demanufacturing machine. It was done in a very kind of like punk um, type of approach. Um, now. So here's the thing in operation. This is actually at LACMA in about 2007 or something like this. Research Labs, this is a different video, um, and I'll just play this as I talk about this to give an overview. They, they really embrace this re kind of almost like a Mad Max kind of uh, approach of recycling discarded industrial electronics and mechanisms. Um, and so they're... They went on. They went on to build very large projects and do these kind of mechanical performances like this. That would 
kind of be nihilistic, violent, um, without humans, without dialogue, and these machines would move around and kind of attack each other, and then it would just kind of end. And they ended up having a massive following in, in uh, around the world, but especially in the Bay Area, um, building machines like this and, and doing performances over the past 40 years. So, what can we what can we take out of this? Out of you know, survival research labs making machines that kind of violently smash into each other. Um, you could take a number of things out of this, but what I'd like to show is this idea of a zombie technology. Now, one interesting model of um, how technology evolves is with is modeled by uh, a research group called the Gartner Group. They sell research reports on how to evaluate your company, and they sell these. Um, projections of how technology will evolve for tons and tons of money. They're a professional research uh, conglomerate, but they they describe the technology goes through what's called a hype cycle. Now, they typically see the technology starts, it gets exciting, and it goes through um, a phase of hype. Like maybe we can think of like Bitcoin over the past five years has gone through this hype where it goes and it becomes very, very exciting for people, but it's not really mature yet. And so it crashes down. And this is, so Bitcoin is somewhere around here right now. So it's gone through a hype cycle phase and where it will only become profitable after it crashes, okay? So Gartner Group proposes this idea, which I think is really interesting for artists because um, I'll play a little bit. Then moving from left to right, we track an innovation as it moves through five predictable phases, with some examples from recent hype cycles. Phase one is the innovation trigger. That's when an event like a technological breakthrough or a product launch gets people talking. Startups emerge, venture capital investments skyrocket, and first mover organizations start launching experiments. Phase two is the peak of inflated expectations. This is when the excitement brings in more suppliers and people using the product. There's a whole lot of media coverage and hype, but there's still limited proof that the innovation can deliver what you need. Then there's phase three, the trough of disillusionment. This happens when the original excitement wears off and early adopters report predictable performance. I won't show the whole video, but basically there's complex models that try to predict how technology will evolve. Now, what's interesting is that artists aren't on this. Surprise, surprise. This is only for, for selling stuff. Now, what I, when I looked at this, I'm like, well, what about vinyl? How does vinyl fit into this? Because everybody throw out their vinyl in like the 80s or 90s when CDs came out, then it came back and it's sort of like it died, but then it comes re back and revisits us and it warps in different ways. So to extend this model out, now this is a bigger graph, you have your hype cycle like this, Gartner Group basically projects that technology will take a while until the engineering adoption becomes mature enough and manufacturing becomes mature enough to take off as a consumer product. Okay, so this is kind of the sales of the thing. This is the excitement of the thing that goes through a, a hype cycle and crash and then, now what's interesting here is that I really see opportunities for artists working here, kind of the new media art, Kind of stuff where you're looking at very new cutting edge stuff. You know, a university is a perfect place to, to explore what all these new technologies can do for us, right? But another thing is on this on this obsolete edge, there's also a lot of opportunities for artists because this is where you get free stuff. This is where all the junk that's thrown out, the boom boxes, the old 
PCs, the old phones, the, you know, whatever. So, I see that artistic use, I mean, this is, this is biased, but that's why I wrote it. I see that, I see that it, it's more exciting at the beginning when it's a general consumer product that's maybe a little bit less exciting, but then it comes back up and, and because it's free and available, that it's easy to recycle things after the fact. And so I see that artists really have a great opportunity in this new media phase of, of um, exploring potentials of new stuff. This is like selling products. And an artist can sell products, and as designers, you can do a lot of stuff there. But then there's also this kind of zombie phase. And this is really interesting for artists because, you know, that old keyboard you have, or the old instrument, or the, the stuff that's forgotten about, is this is actually something that Gartner Group completely ignores. This after phase, how, how stuff gets recycled after it walks out of the store. Um, you know, I put vinyl up there, although I'm on the vinyl. So, basically, I see that groups like SRL are interesting because they remind us that this zombie phase of, of and, and I should say that SRL, the way that they would get those machines is going into industrial places that were abandoned and stealing them. Like going into abandoned warehouses, hauling this stuff out, bringing it to their truck, bringing it back, and then figuring out reverse engineering and figuring it out, but getting it for free, kind of illegally, um, or a bad, you know, kind of out of the junk pile. So this junk pile kind of approach, I I think is worth thinking about as not that it's just obsolete, but that it can be reborn into something really interesting. And I think vinyl is the interesting example. The Gartner Group doesn't have any, any model. The hype cycle model has not, no language to describe what happens to uh, vinyl. And you can, see, you can see things reinvented as junk constantly. Maybe not so much in Santa Barbara, because everything is really nice here. Or around Irvine, where I spend a lot of time, but in lots of other places in the world, that you see constant rebuilding stuff, refixing things, repurposing stuff. Okay, all of this stuff I see as 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 taking advantage of the obsolete and reinventing with the obsolete as a starting point. And and in so in summary, I would say that a group like SRL is interesting because. They're, they're the, kind of the mad max of artistry, right? That they're the, they're, they take this approach, this kind of post-apocalyptic thing, and they try to make it into something. Now, not everybody likes SRL, and that's okay, but I still think that, the, 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 that they show an important thing culturally that trash doesn't just, I mean, you could, you could read many things into it, from environmental kind of approaches to recycling things to um, visions of a post-apocalyptic future <laughs> or whatever. But um, for me, it's interesting. And I'm happy to just tell you about Survival Research Labs, because it's a historically significant uh, group. OK, so in summary, what is the DIY mindset? Well. We've gone through a few, a few of these terms, burlesque, wabi-sabi, zombie technology. There's a whole other bunch in my book. Um, but in summary, the wabi-sabi can be thought of as a beauty of imperfection. Burlesque can be thought of as a class-based up and down, punching up and punching down, uh, which is a really useful dynamic, and in terms of reinventing stuff that is obsolete, just to encourage you to, that there's a lot of creative potential in discarded stuff. I guess that uh, would be my main kind of point. Um, so, re, you know, thinking about the beauty of imperfection, of 
high and low, kind of attacking each other as a dynamic. And uh, old and new. And the idea of the zombie phase of things after they go obsolete. And there are a whole bunch of other themes that I talk about um, in my book. Jugard is a term that has to do with frugal innovation. Chindogu is like a, a creatively useless kind of tool. Device art, circuit bending, uh, people who work with identity and gender issues. Um, cyber feminism I have a big section on. Um, and all sorts of stuff. So feel free to check it out. And it is, and actually on the Zoom chat, there's a link uh, to the book that you can download uh, for free. And that's it. That's it for my talk, so thanks. Any questions? Question. Yeah. Um, so, returning to your presentation on the concept of wabi sabi and how you're, you know, using this notion of imperfections as a way to, as a lens for examining types of DIY production, um, could you talk about the ways in which this lens does or does not encompass a notion of skill? Because you compare this idea of wabi-sabi to things that are handmade, but you also use the example of comparing them to things that look junky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I guess like I definitely, like I'm not particularly skilled at making a lot of things by hand, so they might look junky when I do it, but there are other people who are extremely skilled and by comparison something made with a machine or through an automated process might yeah. look junky. So how do you think about that? And especially like in the concept, context of DIY, how do you think about skill? Yeah, well, and I should say that I'm not like a Zen Buddhist scholar or anything, and that my, my knowledge of wabi-sabi is based off of, um, you know, knowing the concept for, me, for five years or so. I'm not like some great scholar on the topic. But um, the uh, wabi-sabi, I think, I think skill, honestly, isn't a major component of wabi. Doesn't need to be a major component of wabi sabi. Like, for example, if your child, if you have kids, and if a child would bring a drawing home, I would imagine that that, and they worked at it and gave it as a gift. I'm assuming that that there would be a kind of wabi sabi beauty to that, even if. There's, it's not the most skilled, mm -hmm. but the idea of skilled is, um, it's kind of subjective because it's like, because because actually, it can look very skilled, but it doesn't. It can look very skilled and be not skilled, or it can be look unskilled and be very skilled. Um, for example, like Nam Jun Peik was actually very very good at electronics. But he kind of intentionally made this thing not looking great um, and chose to make it more rustic. So I, in terms of what I understand for the idea of wabi-sabi, there's both the idea of natural aging and the handmade component together. And it can either be, it can be both. You, you or it, you can have things that where many where uh, that are naturally worn from just people walking, and that could you could see that as beautiful without there being any skill involved. <clears throat> so um, I mean, does anybody have uh, happen to have? known anything about wabi sabi because because i mean the way the way that i the way that i see it is that it's much more about the the rustic it's almost like the the word patina or if you think of like the patina of something 
where that's, that's a word that refers to kind of like the age, the kind of the good age that it has on it, the patina of something. Um, I think of wabi-sabi like patina to a certain extent. Okay, I mean, I think there's a interesting, uh, the, the point you drew out about Nam June Pipe being a very skilled engineer and visual artist and making deliberate decisions on the aesthetics of his work to achieve a given effect does like clearly relate to this notion of skillfulness. So I, I think there are some interesting connections there. I'd be happy to talk to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, but he wasn't really super great. He, he had help from his, his brother and other people that saw him kind of flailing around, and he ref repeatedly refused that help. Okay. So he, he, he knew that he wasn't the greatest, but he, he had this insistence on doing it himself for whatever reason, because I think he didn't want that to look perfect. Like, it was more a decision of himself to just keep it as his own thing, independent of how... He, he wanted to kind of render that 100% himself, so. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Any other questions about the... It could be about <coughs> the book or about my projects or my path of grad school or whatever. Yep. Um, thanks for your presentation and thanks for the meme um, <laughs> that you introduced to the world. That's very impressive. Um, so my question is more related to uh, the, the artwork that you did uh, with the cockroach. Yeah. I, sorry. <clears throat> I've been signing that work a lot in my essays because I think it's a really fascinating work and makes you think about, as you mentioned it and described it, it makes you think about art and our relation to the bio and the technical from different lenses. Yeah. And later in your presentation, you um, discuss this idea of after phase. And I'm curious, what was the after phase of the cockroach in this piece? And like, how do you, how did you, um, yeah, well, like, and how did you consider the, the interaction that you have as an artist and as a kind of a controller with the, this living thing? Yeah, I mean, that, that project took me on a ride all over the world. I mean, that project kind of exploded at the right time in the right place, and I just, I happened to get a couple of demos that then ended up kind of, you know, the next thing I'm like, Ars Electronica, the next thing is like, you know, all over the place and it just kind of exploded. So I ended up kind of building uh, three versions of that machine, actually. The first version was my kind of grad school version, but then it was not very reliable. And so then I rebuilt it again and then I rebuilt it for a third time. Um, but with that project, it just kept on going and going and going. I ended up like probably shown that in like eight to 10 countries or something like enough, like around a lot. So um, the end point of that was sort of me getting a job as a professor. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Uh, but that, that project, I kind of burnt out on cockroaches, to be honest with you. I had so many cockroaches, and I was like, for years, I was known as the cockroach guy to everybody. And I was like the guy to call for like cockroach entertainment, called Garnet. Um, but, um, so I actually, because it was successful enough that I felt like I, tr I did it, demoed it so many times in lots of different places, I, I sort of did other stuff after that project. <laughs> I did the Outrun project, um, where, where it was like, instead of the insect driving, I sort of flipped it on a human, where the human is kind of in a, like, a theme in a lot of my work is kind of technology kind of being in control, but kind of fighting with humans, and kind of a love-hate relationship with technology. 
where sort of like technology is wonderful, but at the same time, it sort of can give us tons of power, but can also really limit us in, in other ways, that it's, that it's kind of a good and evil at the same time. And so, and I really like that kind of bashing heads in a project like the cockroach robot, where it's like, you see this thing running, you, you wonder like, wow, this is the most advanced thing I've ever seen an insect in, but then you're like, but that poor insect, I wonder if it's like, okay. And then you start empathizing with it, and, and it's a little bit similar scenario in the, in, the, in the video game, except it's just a human driving, kind of blinded by technology, kind of surrounded by technology, a little bit oblivious to the world. Um, so yeah, after the cockroach robot really came the Outrun uh, project. That was my main next one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for your lecture. I wanted to go back to the idea of the zombie, um, the zombie um, uh, part of your lecture with um, the um, the obsolete robotics yeah. part. What? How do you see that type of research playing out now? In um, I think in in tier one universities, like, are you thinking about we're going to take old computers and try to figure out an analog to digital new bridge? Are you thinking about like you know supercomputer clusters with old you know CPUs and GPUs like? Can you give us a sense of what you think the kind of this next phase of obsolete, um, obsolete technology could be? Like, what are you looking at? I mean, to, to be frank, most of what I, like the scale that I'm thinking of isn't so much like, you know, taking a old computer lab and repurposing it into, you know, installing Linux on everything and doing something with it or whatever. The The... The level that I'm thinking more of is sort of like the grad student that can barely pay rent, is just you know keeping things together with the TA ship, who's cruising around. And I mean, I loved UCI for this. I would get so much stuff by going around behind loading docks and stuff, looking for stuff for projects, or, or getting to know facilities people who who would who would uh, scrap stuff. Um, I got an electric car this way. I got, I got tons of different things. Um, but um, it's more kind of, I, I mean, the approach that I'm, I, the, the, the people that I'm trying to speak to in my book, it's more based at the individual artist level, where it's, it's just encouraging them to not discount stuff that is obsolete, that it has a lot of, creative potential inside of it. But I'm not thinking about that. I haven't thought about that really in a way where it's like a systematic. Um, I mean, there's, there, but there are movements like in, in uh, electronic music with like something like circuit bending that takes, takes an approach like that and really goes full force into that mode. You know, where I would say circuit bending is like the zombie kind of audio equivalent of of where you take something, it's like the post-consumer, way after the consumer thing is done, after how you modify that and, and manipulate it. So for me, it's, it's more just about, a big component is the cost, and, and more like free materials for artists than, um, but I'm sure it could be spun out into, Bigger initiative, yeah. Just to follow up, and your work with Dorpot, um, how how did that work inspire this book? And when you said about maker, the maker space and maker fair, how do you see students here possibly making their own network and their own type of outreach for a community? Yeah, I mean, well, I should say that I I moved here from Canada. Thanks for coming. Uh, I moved here from Canada. I didn't know anybody. You know, I knew Simon Penny. I knew who Simon Penny was, but I didn't know anybody. 
and, and I moved to LA, had three little kids, and didn't know anybody, and was like busy with childcare and all this kind of stuff. And so I, I had a friend doing this dork bot thing in uh, Chicago, and one in LA, and one in New York. And so I just sort of joined the bandwagon, and they, they had a structure for this that, I, that they encouraged people to copy. So I basically started up a Southern California one. And um, that, I would, if you're a grad student, you could absolutely do this. And, and honestly, if you want to get a job after you're done, getting to know people and organizing events and, and doing stuff where you're, you're building a community and you're help, trying to help that community and, and initiate events, that for me really transformed the LA, whole LA area into for what could be very lonely where it's a little pockets of people all over the place. It sort of helped build, gel a community and I got to know like, I think you had come, George had come out to some of the events. Casey Reese from UCLA would always come. Uh, there's Robert Nidefer would always come. There's faculty from all over that would come, and and it just was sort of a small event that I started. Uh, it hit at the right time. It was before the, the 3D printing exploded, and it was before even the Arduino had come out. So, or it was right about the same time, and so. It hit at the right time. Then Arduino came out. Then 3D printing, and then the interest in maker stuff was just exploded, right? Um, and it was very interesting, though. But it was all just done very low key, just a mailing list and a crappy website, and contacting a lot of people and, and begging them to come. A lot of it was was just sort of doing the work in asking people to come. Yeah, uh, I, I should say that here in Santa Barbara we have a Santa Barbara hackerspace which continues on back from about that time. Yeah, and it still seems pretty viable. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't really know how how big it is, but it's not disappearing. And I visit there from time to time. Yeah, and they have you know actually a pretty good setup for. Yes. And th those those labs, th those maker spaces that formed out of that whole maker thing uh, forming, are fabulous. You know, they're fabulous, and they they they're they're still around, and they're still doing projects, and they're a really fabulous resource after people graduate, and you don't have UCSB to hang around in. Um, they're they're fabulous if you need you know three D printing, laser cutting, or whatever done. So, um, yeah, yeah, yes. So uh, I just wanted to like kind of gently push back on this idea of like the main benefit of using these like salvage technologies is cost effectiveness because my last three jobs were at record store, audio repair technician, <laughs> yeah. and hardware, uh, hardware yeah. store. And, and I just like, uh, it's I, true. I've often thought about like the reason why people will spend money and like on things that aren't necessarily like convenient or cost effective and I think a lot of it has to do with their like relationship to the technology in the nostalgic sense and also the way that you like interact with it and like say for example if I was to make a project that was exactly like a Nanjun Pike piece now it carries a different connotation because now the like the medium itself and then the things going into the art piece are instead of in his time, like, you know, the CRT TVs that he was using were what people had. Yeah. Now, it's, it's, it carries, like, a, a, a nostalgic connotation, and obviously nostalgia is a very big, like, moving, it's something that moves people, right? Like, you used to look at, like, Netflix or, like, HBO, and everything is, like, drenched in nostalgia, so it's obviously, like, a very, like, powerful thing for people, and I think that's part of the, like, benefit of using some of these salvage technologies. And just the price thing, like, I do circuit, I do circuit bed sets and I do circuit bed like video, yeah. video equipment as well, and I found, like, it's much cheaper for me to just, like, open up Maximus P with yes. my, like, eight, $8 a month subscription yeah. and make something in there 
as opposed to if I was to go out to like you know uh, vintage or use electronics or whatever in, in LA or Apex Electronics mm -hmm. and like dig for some stuff yeah. and then like go to Mauser and buy all like the stuff to fix it and then go to like Adafruit and buy all the stuff to, to bend it and like have it be controlled from a microcontroller and stuff like that ends up being like much more expensive. But the result of what I get from going through that process, from the process itself and then the equipment that I use yields a different result. Yeah. But sometimes I'm more like inclined towards just because it's like the quality of it. Yeah. Or with that nostalgia factor and with just like the uncertainty of using these kind of like circuit bent things, the aleatoric nature of, of the circuit bends and things like that. So yes. I just wondering if you had any thoughts on, on yeah. that. Yeah. No, that's amazing. And I mean, I, I I can't stop but laugh when, and other people too, who, you know, experience the same thing. You go, yeah, it's like you want to do the vintage thing and it's like huge pain in the ass, huge expense. And so I think like it, and it gives a totally different, it's a totally different process. So I, I think you absolutely nailed it on the head. Um, I think though with obsolete stuff that I mean, there is there is a very short window after stuff becomes obsolete when it's usable and cheap, mm -hmm. but then it becomes like it goes from being just j free junk. It quickly moves over into like, like like for example, a speak and, a classic speak and spell used to be you used to be able to go to garage sales and find those for twenty dollars or whatever. Now you have to go into eBay and spend one hundred and fifty dollars or two hundred dollars. Um, so it's true that it goes through a phase where it, 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 it it's only cheap for a short period of time. Mm, that's a good point. And, um, but definitely there's a lot more, there's a lot more to using old stuff than, than price. Because mm -hmm. you have, in using those old projects, it's almost like you revive all that old history of all those media formats and all the ways of doing and thinking that it's like a bit of like a time travel uh, getting into that space. And so, and in some circumstances that can be straightforward, but most of the time it's not, you know? So yeah, I think it definitely in terms of, or if we think of like hype cycle going and then getting expensive and then being cheap, it, it gets expensive again, you know? It, or it, it gets classic and it gets to be a huge problem um, at, so if you would extend that diagram out, it would, there'd be more ripple, there'd be more, uh, you know, like vinyl now is, is sells really well and it's a really mainline kind of audio format. Um, I guess for me, part of that was just thinking of it beyond the, a lot of the, a lot of the kind of writing on technology kind of ended as soon as the thing stopped selling in the store. And for me, that was more kind of like what, where I was kind of like, well, there's so much more to it. Like, there's more, so much more to it than after it first gets sold. Um, there's an afterlife to all this, all these artifacts that circulate are all around. So for me, the idea of the zombie was just sort of starting to articulate kind of the afterlife of that stuff. But but it's true that that price definitely it definitely changes and it definitely gets much more complicated and the older it gets the more you need to almost time travel into that zone mm -hmm. and that can be very ex that can, can be very expensive and difficult yeah what would you say are like the uh, the like technologies that are most accessible like price wise right now like probably like CDs and like iPod touches phones old phones old phones Old phones are super, super easy. They're, they're, yeah, the, the stuff that you can, old Bluetooth speakers, PCs. I mean, it's a challenge though to think about how to creatively use those things in interesting ways. Because it's like, how do you use an old phone in a creative artistic way? It's like, well, it, it's a bit of a hard problem. Yeah. As a note, there was a really great paper at DIS this year from Wendy Jew's lab on using hoverboards to get cheap stepper motors. It's mm -hmm. really interesting, but definitely cheaper than purchasing them. And also great during the chip shortage, all the other components they were able to harvest from hoverboards being interesting example. Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, not so much traction from Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, but more of 
kind of a common dream uh, um, when listening to, to, to your lecture and also, you know, which of course is also connected to, I mean, it's very nostalgic for me and for some other people here on the call, like Eddie Ray Hoffman and so on, for sure. Uh, uh, and George and everybody that, that lived through this time, you know, uh, including Mark, but going to performances of SRL and, you know, all, all of it. Uh, uh, but one thing is really, you know, I think it's, it's, it's also part of history that is not so well researched because, you know, all of this stuff is very West centric, let's call it so, right? I mean, you have, we have, you know, and when I say West, I mean also Japan, right? Even though Japan is its own very particular uh, approach and, you know, maybe they was Korean, you know, in Germany and, you know, and the States. So, uh, um, so there's, you know, he was very much operating in the Western paradigm. And, um, you know, whereas in, in the, let's say, in the Eastern, Eastern Europe, uh, during the Cold War, and, of course, in, in a lot of, of Southeast Asia, uh, you see, and, and that's the truth, and Latin America, <laughs> the rest of the world, uh, 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 you have, and you had and you still have enormous DIY uh, uh, cultures and subcultures that are actually using technologies in like the most amazing ways. And the reappropriation uh, uh, is, uh, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, repairing and so on was a necessity that, you know, because there was no potential for consumption and reconsumption. So uh, uh, in, in those countries that are of course poorer, uh, technology was reused and repurposed in so many different ways. And um, for example, and this is part of my personal history, I talked about it a lot because in, in former Yugoslavia, it was not only me that was former Yugoslavia, we had uh, actually something called technical culture or the music was a state run uh, not program but organization essentially like you would have you know culture culture uh, you know uh, orchestras and choirs or what have you or theater groups that you would join you know amateurs uh, you had also technical culture and the technical culture was actually you know completely uh, uh, maker culture, right? I mean, this was absolutely, uh, you know, what maker culture, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, let's say, rediscovered was part of a legacy of what was going on in Eastern Europe. And, and I know from colleagues, I have not that experience myself because I haven't worked in Indonesia, for example, but Indonesia has, till today, a lot of this. Uh, uh, movements and so on. So it's just, I, I'm just putting it out there because I think that it's, uh, you know, in your next uh, uh, exploration, since you've done such a good job in kind of covering what, what has been happening with device art, uh, uh, you know, in Japan, and, and of course, the whole, you know, let's say the Western world. I think you know, it would be great to also reconnect to this uh, other type of DIY culture that has sprung up in technology and purpose and so on. I think it's a, it's a very, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a very rich area. I'm, I'm sure, I'm not an expert uh, on this, I'm sure the scholars have already looked into this, but maybe not from your point of view, you know, because I, I love the introduction, and I'll end here, of, of, the, of the term burlesque in all of this. I think it's, it's, it's really precise and kind of beautiful uh, uh, because it really, it really ignites uh, a very particular class bridging uh, you know, operation, and this is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. And, and I mean, you bring up an important point that um, I think DIY for me is sort of a stand-in for thinking about how most stuff is 
almost built or maintained around the world that's not professionally manufactured or professionally serviced. That this idea of DIY is kind of soaked, soaked through the world really thickly in, in lots of places and that in a lot of ways the DIY approach is kind of the natural approach that most people kind of embrace or are forced to use when you when you have to do something yourself and you don't really have the exact training or the resources but you're just trying to figure it out and so that of course you know it it's of course all through Santa Barbara but it's 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 very very active in tons of other places in the world you know where where that's just the way that stuff is done it's not called DIY it's just called fixing shit you know it's just it's just like surviving it's just called surviving it's not you know not some book written about it it's just getting a car to start or or duct taping on your rear view mirror on your car or something um, that that's the way for, for me the DIY mindset is sort of like if you subtract modern uh, consumer culture out of the equation DIY is a lot of the stuff that's kind of remaining you know it's sort of like a haphazard kind of approach that we all kind of take some more than others but um, to me it's it's sort of an attitude of, of not not really self-sufficiency it's more like just just it's it's not like always empowering it's, it's often very limiting uh, and scary trying to build something on your own so in the book I, I basically just try to dig through using art examples um, trying to dig through kind of some of the dynamics kind of some of the themes that go through this that I think apply to that whole maker scene people working with tech, but I wanted to do more than that and have have it uh, comment on just DIY in general as as an approach, which is kind of an impossible task, you know, to try to describe everything that's outside of standard consumer culture as, as one thing, but I tried. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, definitely. Not only tried. I mean, you, you did it. I'm just saying that, you know, I think it's uh, really interesting how, uh, uh, you know, we identify in the West DIY as a paradigm that somewhere else is really a, a, a way of doing things in life, right? You know, uh, I think, for example, as mentioned, the paper of the repurposing of petrol motors, right, from hoverboards. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, in a way, um, that's you know, you, you know, there's, there's probably like 40 other papers that should be written about repurposing hydrogen a lot. I mean, I've seen all kinds of stuff in the past, right? especially you know when when the East kind of opened up uh, after the, the Cold War in the early 90s. You had this whole you know, DIY satellite culture. Uh, essentially, people uh, uh, mostly in Eastern Europe and uh, you know the Middle East kind of uh, starting to use satellites uh, um, as you know on the reception side, but still to build these incredible rigs to be start being connected to the to the wider. Uh, uh, world and so on, right? So, yeah, well, there's a mark that's just posted in afridash.com archives. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot there, but this is so inspiring, and I think that, uh, 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 you know, we'll, we'll uh, uh, definitely hear more, and hopefully, I've heard, uh, you know, uh, 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 I've heard that there's uh, uh, potential that we'll see you more in California uh, uh, soon, so we'll definitely explore ways to uh, um, work together and so on. Yeah, I have a kid who has a job at SpaceX and a one that's a teacher in Irvine, so I'm, I'm uh, 
tethered to Southern California to a certain extent. So I'm happy to come back. Yeah. I think unless there's anything else, I think we're done. So thank you.